Before we get started, we just wanted to thank Old Republic Surety for sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. For more information on Old Republic Surety, visit www.orsurety.com. Now, on to our show. You're listening to Let's Get Surety. Let me hear your bonding talk with Kat Shamapande. Hey everyone, it's Kat Shamapande. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Let's Get Shirty. Today I have with me my co-host, Mark McCallum, CEO of NESBP. Hey, Mark. Hey, Kat. Great day to be here. Glad to have you. And we also have with us today as a guest, Todd Braggins. And he is a managing partner at Ernstrom and Dresty. Hey, Todd. Hey, how are you guys doing today? Thank you very much for having me with you. Thanks so much for being with us, Todd. So before we dive in, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and about your firm? Sure. Just briefly, um, uh, I'm a member at Erdstrom and Dresty and have been there almost 30 years now. And our firm uh, focuses our practice in the construction and surety industries and I've been fortunate enough to uh, focus almost entirely on the surety industry for almost 30 years. And I have, uh, since I didn't even know what surety law was when I was in law school, (laughs) I have Bill Ernstrom and John Dresty to thank for that. That's awesome. Well, we're excited to have you share your years of expertise with us today as we dive in and talk about the decision to finance. So... How do you get to the spot where that that you're getting to that decision making process? Well, it comes up in a variety of ways. I you know I wrote an article that'll be in the uh, surety uh, uh, NASBP quarterly uh, this summer. It it often comes up in, in, uh, very abruptly and in, in the context of a difficulty in making payroll and very quick decisions have to be made. But it's usually a series of events that evolve over time that is a general deterioration in the principal's financial status. And there are a variety of reasons we can talk about that, how they get there, but it's usually a, a process that sometimes escapes the detection of uh, the underwriting and even the bond producer because it's subtle and happens slowly. And often the principal does everything that they can do to really try to minimize it and not show that it's occurring. Todd, are there are there certain red flags that you would identify or that could give you a heads up that this might occur? You know, I think uh, a couple things come to mind. It's the um, uh, you know, if you're getting quarterly or yearly uh, financial statements, take a close look at those. See what they're showing. Is there a downward trend? The other thing that seems to, the obvious one, it would be a payment bond claim, a series of payment bond claims. Now, everyone can uh, be subject to a payment bond claim. And, you know, when they are tendered to principal and principal's counsel, it's relatively easy to ascertain whether there's any real issue there or not. Uh, But when they start to pile on is when it catches your attention. And, um, you know, it, it, it's it's something to keep an eye on anytime the payment bond claims start coming in. Sure. Yeah, so clusters of payment bonds, you need to be uh, cognizant of what might be going on, right? That's for sure. Yeah. So once you get into that situation and, and you're considering the decision to finance, I know there's a there's four C's when you're considering the decision to finance. What are the what are those? Well, the, the four C's are the same ones that come into play uh, in the initial underwriting context, cash, capacity, collateral, and character. And, you know, what, I, what, I, what, what I'm concerned with, what we're going to talk about here a little bit, is the character issue, because I think it's sometimes overlooked. And, mm-hmm. and, but it's very, very important, and, and it's an area that I think the bond producer can have a just great input and great knowledge and insight. That that's really interesting. So, in a certain way, you see that as uh, really a fundamental threshold for the decision uh, by a surety. Well, you know, I think it appropriately is uh, in theory, 
but I do not think it often is in practice. Okay. And, and, and therein lies the rub. That, that's where things can get a little dangerous. Um, it, it, it is very important. But, you know, you, let's remember, we, this is a collaborative decision, uh, a financing decision. So the claims folks are involved. The underwriters are involved. We have outside consultants in the form of accountants and construction engineers, attorneys, and if smartly played, the bond producers play in the role in this as well. And it, 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 I find this is, I think the reason I wanted to talk about this and write about this is I find this financing process to be the most interesting and rewarding component of my surety legal career. Because if it's done correctly, a win-win strategy where everyone mitigates loss or possibly eliminates loss and results in an account continuing on to do business with the surety, everyone wins. And it's, it's just, it, there's no better feeling. It, it really is a wonderful result. Unfortunately, it doesn't always happen that way. Right, right. I imagine that that decision involves, as you said, a lot of consultants, but there's a lot of uh, trust that's required, a lot of need for communications, a lot of need for everybody to be on the same uh, playing field or same understanding. Would you agree with that? No question. You know, look at the key to this whole process is going to be information. The better the information, the better the decision, and the greater chance to mitigate or eliminate loss. So it is it is very critical uh, to have that information. And in that character context, Remember that our bond producers are in the best position uh, as, as opposed to anyone else on that financing team to know the, the principal's history, their strengths, their weaknesses, you know, and, and, you know, perhaps most importantly, their quirks. And where, where it becomes a little more interesting is, is it a quirk or is it a personality issue right. that puts the financing effort in, into jeopardy? Well, you know, that's that's a great point. I mean, as as we all know, that surety is a relationship business and the producer establishes that relationship over time, which enables the producer, him or her, to really kind of see the principal in a lot of different contexts, a lot of situations. So uh, I, I would assume that if they can bring that to bear, that's beneficial for the surety to make a decision. It it certainly is. And I've been involved in situations where the bond producer is really not invited to the table. And I think that's a mm. mistake. And, you know, look, at as, as we talked about, cash and collateral are the money decisions. The, the, this whole process is really a sliding scale of objective to subjective factors. Cash and capacity and collateral are a little more on the object or much more on the objective side. The character issue is much more subjective. And the rest of that team, it doesn't have the information on the character, but the rest of the team, as a result, will focus on cash. And that's pretty easy to ascertain. You know, you, you can figure out what the, what, what the cash on hand is, what the remaining contract funds are. They can be protected relatively easily by assignments of contract proceeds or establishing um, escrow accounts so that they can be safeguarded. As we go down that objective to subjective scale, the collateral is where I've run into trouble. And, and, it, and it's happened to me, and uh, it's, I'm sure it's happened to many others over, over the years. You have to closely scrutinize those financial statements. For example, you know, we've got real property. There may look like there's real value in some of this real property. Well, okay, how is that property held? Are they LLCs? Are there other members? Mm. Are those members indemnitors? Because if you're going to get, if, you, if you're looking for collateral and a source of cash at the end of the day from an LLC, you have to make sure you have a, a formal resolution and permission from the other members that the principal is allowed, allowed to use them. Same thing with, with, with uh, mortgages. There's a big difference between obtaining a first mortgage on a property and a second mortgage. A second mortgage is going to require more work, more time, and less money at the end of the day 
because you 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 are satisfying the first mortgage first and you get what's left over but you may have to expend all the money to actually foreclose so these title searches are very important uh to make sure there are other uh, any other clouds on title are discovered early on and where the where the bond producer comes in in that context is then you're going to have local knowledge of these properties right now, how what are they worth what's the what's the real value you can get them appraised, but what's the local value? What's what's the real marketability of these things if you had to sell one? You know, those, you need those that are the boots on the ground perspective that the producer has. Absolutely, absolutely, and and you know, I just want to mention that another. I've I've run into problems over the years on e- on equipment because that mm. can look like a very valuable commodity uh, on a balance sheet uh, or a financial statement. But it's it's when you look at it, is it is was it owned? Is it leased? Are there liens on there? Uh, you know, remember that if the day comes where you have to sell some of this collateral to uh, recoup your payments, your financing, a gradual orderly sale is going to result in a significantly greater uh, a result for the surety than a fire sale. And that's mm. another area. The bond producer can step up big here because they know the local market conditions. They might be able to refer you to a great appraiser. And pr- probably most importantly, in the best advantage, they may have other accounts that might want to buy this equipment. And, you know, if you're not doing it at a wholesale auction, you're going to gain much, much better um, recovery. Right, that makes sense. Um, certainly, the the producer is, I'm sure, visited the contractor's office, visited the contractor's yard, knows the conditions of the equipment, knows the conditions of the property, and as you said, has that market intelligence about other potential purchasers and appraisers and all the rest. Um, yeah. I, I- Go ahead. Excuse me. I was just going to add quickly on affirmative claims. We often hear that um, the, the principal has affirmative claims that can do go a long way toward recovery of any financing that's extended. And just a couple cautionary items. Hmm. You know, as the attorney who often inherits these claims, um, they have to be very thoroughly vetted. You need to get your, your construction consultants in there to vet them for both entitlement and damages. You may be entitled to a, a claim, but can you prove the damages? And then, and then the part that really the attorneys are looking at, and most people gloss over, is do you have the witnesses? You know, are the principal's witnesses still around? Are they available? Are they willing to testify? And then once you meet them, are they believable? Right. And along with that is, do you have the contemporaneous documentation that backs this claim up? And, and finally, what, what I've found, I've developed absolutely wonderful relationships with many principal counsel over the years because, in my opinion, if they have capable counsel and they have, uh, have institutional knowledge of the claim, and, and let's say the surety has to finance the, the uh, legal fees for this claim, I generally recommend the principal's counsel be allowed to pursue it with oversight from me or someone like me, because you don't want to have to pay more to educate me or someone right. else on, on a claim and get up to speed. It really can work out to everyone's advantage to continue on the path with the principal's counsel, assuming they're, you know, you know them and they're qualified and competent. Right. Right. You, you know, I imagine uh, the producer plays other uh could be very positive roles in a situation uh, that may result in financing. I imagine that the principal, particularly if this is something that's new, might be a little nervous about this and mm. uh, need some uh, c- context and normalization. Do you think that's uh, true from your experience, Todd? Absolutely. I, w- I wanted to make sure we talked about that. Thanks for bringing it up. It, it is very important. You know, most of the principals have never been through this process before. Many of them have never experienced financial distress. So this is a, a you know extremely nerve-wracking situation for them to go through. 
through this process. And, and probably the most helpful person can be that familiar and trusted voice of the bond producer who they may go back with many, many years. And you can kind of dial down the pressure, you know, emphasize that everybody's working toward the same goal, that we're all on the same team, and can bring a sense of calm to the principal and facilitate the really important exchange of vital information that's going to make this decision, you know, a good decision for all parties. Right. Uh, Todd, can you share an example of, you know, where you've seen this process work really well? Well, you know, uh, uh, I think where it works best is a motivated principal who uh, wants to uh, continue with the business, wants to continue the bonding line, and is going through a temporary uh, issue. That could be caused by a, a big claim. Let's say he's, uh, he or she has a huge claim on a project and is running short of cash, but everything else seems to be in order. Well, you help them through that process and help them get through the claim process, and you come out the other side. Now, they're going to pledge collateral, and you know, and there may be – I've uh, structured deals where we, we, we uh, sell certain assets as of certain dates. To, to slowly recoup the loss or the financing. And when the principal is motivated to continue on and to adhere to its deal, a person of good character, those sales happen when they're supposed to. And if, if the, and, and so the surety is repaid on the schedule that everyone agreed to. And those people abide by their agreements. Where you run into problems, is, you know, some people that do not have the character that we're looking for is, is where, the, where, where, the, where the problem results. I mean, remember, a, a misjudgment in cash or capacity or collateral can be overcome through a principal's strong character and, 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 and diligence, but the converse may not be true. Mm. A misguided character assessment may ruin even the strongest collateral cash or capacity position. And what I found is <laughs> with, with almost any relationship in life, business or personal, the signs of failure are usually there to be seen, but are sometimes ignored or minimized. And if you'll, you'll indulge me, I'll tell you a quick story on that. I, yeah, had, a, yeah. I had an initial meeting with a, a principal and a claims representative in an office building. And this, this uh, man was... Uh, uh, a little rough around the edges, took pride in uh, being a physically superior man to other uh, gentlemen and, and threw his weight around a little bit in a physical sense. And <laughs> he was introduced to me and, and the claims person. And it turned out I was quite a bit taller than this guy. And our claims representative made me look puny. <laughs> so he shook our hands, looked up at us and just said, Gee, he says, you fellas are big. Now, he didn't use the word fellas. It was a little more colorful, but it did start with an F. <laughs> but he, he quickly uh, realized that there was not going to be any physical intimidation involved in this process. And, but uh, not, not, not to be uh, deterred, he sat down across the table from us, and discussion came up about a job trailer computer that was stolen. and He was being accused of taking it out of there against the own public owner's interests and you know, said, well, it was my, my computer. But I, anyway, I had nothing to do with it. And he says, and besides, he said, I, I had, I had recent surgery. I can't lift anything. He said, and so it couldn't have possibly been me. And then he looks right at me across the table and he points his finger in the shape of a gun and pulls the trigger while looking right at me. And he says, but I can still do that. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Now, I'm almost embarrassed to say uh, that we did go on and finance this guy. And, you know, it, it, it worked out exactly like you would have expected. Now, it, it sounds very obvious all these years later, but there were a lot of good reasons and substantial collateral that was put up in it. And, and that's part of why I wanted to, to write and talk about this, is because it can cloud your judgment when the collateral looks good and, you know, it appears that you're going to be able to recover all your financing and then the character 
totally undoes the situation. And, and what I found is I, I could, what I was just shocked to find out is that a person uh, that lacks character can often act contrary to their own personal interests, which are also dovetailed with the interests of the surety. And that's what was most surprising to me. Right. That is, it seems counterintuitive that you would act against your own personal interests. That's exactly right. That, that was a hard one to learn. That was a tough lesson for me to learn because desperate people can do that. And if they lack character, they will do that. Now, people with character, you don't have that concern. Well, going back to uh, something you said earlier, Todd, um, you, you know, I imagine the producer is invaluable in giving you insights. You said, you know, uh, kind of knowing what the quirks are and whether they're impactful is probably very important. Um, you know, have you seen that at play as well? Yeah, I, you know, um, this example I just gave of the situation that did not work well, we did have the bond producer more involved at the beginning. And I will say that as as time went on, she was left behind. Uh, now, uh, so that was an error. And mm. um you know, what I would urge any bond producer to do as I would any other member of this this financing team is you have to take your blinders off and try to be objective. Because remember the bond producer is going to have a long term often a long term relationship with right. this principal. But so the question you really need to ask, are they a good person? Can you really trust them when the chips are down? You know. And they may have treated you as bond producer well over the years because you helped them. But how do they treat everybody else? What's right. their reputation in, in your locale? What, what is their reputation among the subcontractors and suppliers? Because, you know, we, we all have our, our own biases that, that we bring to this process. And that comes from claims, that comes from underwriting, that comes from the bond producer. Everybody has to be a little more objective in this process. And, and it can really help. Well, I mentioned, too, um, the bond producer might know how they're treating their own employees or their project managers yeah. and whether or not they're active or inactive in managing their, uh, their firm. Uh, Very true. Very true. Because oftentimes um, they will let other people run the business. And that's when you start, you know, for whatever reason, they've had some success in there and they're starting to pull back a bit. And that's when they may not be keeping as close an eye on the bidding, you know. So now you're starting to to have a couple bids that are that are problematic, and your project management isn't quite as tight as it should be. And that's that's you know we talked about earlier. How does this happen? Right. That's that slow erosion uh, that we talked about. It can come in many many forms. So now I'm going to put you on the spot. A little bit, and uh -oh. um, so you know we're right now uh, we're kind of at a interesting place with the construction economy. Uh, there is the op, you know perhaps an opportunity for an infrastructure package, but that may be a little bit down the road. Uh, some I think sectors have done well, and others have not in construction. Uh, what do you uh, foresee as the likelihood for uh, financing of the principal in the future. Do you think that's about where it has been, or do you see that you know we need to be more cognizant about potential claims? Well, I think we have to be. Let's start where you just left off. I think we have to be cognizant of potential claims. I think that that some of the money that has flowed has kept uh, people alive and uh, gotten them through the pandemic and this the more funding that is out there will help them uh, continue. You know how this works. If, if, if we're in an upswing economic period, uh, contractors uh, are able to establish a backlog right. and, and keep things moving. Even if you might, you can stumble over a project or two, but, but keep it going by making some good profits on the following jobs. I'm hearing that some of this backlog is significantly decreased. And mm -hmm. because of that, I think we're, it's it's kind of an impending situation that's brewing. Now, as to financing, that's almost an independent uh, um, 
analysis okay. because I talk to certain surety clients that tell me I, we, we will not consider it. Don't even bring it to the table. Right. We're, we're, hmm. yeah. we're not going to do it. Too risky. But others will. And, um, you know, there again, we've talked about some ways to protect themselves and how this analysis needs to go. Uh, I think financing will always be a component of, of uh, potential performance bond claims and contractor issues. And, uh, and I don't think that'll change. I think that that is independent of, of the economy. You may see more of that as the economy dips. And then we see that, that following tail of issues that flow to the surety. And I like what you said earlier, which is if they're going to entertain that option, then character is going to be a key component. And they, they need all the intelligence they can get on that. And that's where the producer can be especially valuable. It really is. I, I would urge uh, all the producers, you know, don't hesitate to impart that unique boots on the ground insight. Nobody yeah. else at that table is going to have it. And it really may th be the difference between uh, uh, success or failure in a financing effort or the difference between whether, a, you know, a financing is, is green lighted or not. That's so interesting. And thank you for sharing all this information on finance with us today, Todd, and, and the important role of the producer in that process. Uh, we'll have to have you back to have another conversation with us soon. Oh, I'd love to. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Todd. Sure. And yeah. Earlier in the episode, Todd did mention that article that he wrote for Surety Bond Quarterly. We'll make sure we include a link to that in the description of today's podcast. You can check out that article for more information as well. Thanks again, Todd. Thank you very much. You've been listening to Let's Get Surety, brought to you by the National Association of Surety Bond Producers. For more information about the NASBP and its members, visit nasbp.org. Before we go, we just wanted to say thank you again to Old Republic Surety for their generous support in sponsoring this episode of Let's Get Surety. For more information on Old Republic Surety, visit www.orsurety.com.